Good morning, everyone. God's blessings to you this morning. Today, we are going to continue our study of Jesus' great Sermon on the Mount. And we come this morning to the last of the eight Beatitudes. It is an amazing one. It is not what many would expect, but it's what we need to expect and recognize. And in it, there is great blessing. So let's begin with prayer. Let's come before the Lord together here this morning. Heavenly Father, we praise and bless your holy name. We thank you that you are the God of all the earth, that you are good, that you are merciful, and that although you have created the universe, you know us each by name. You know us better than we know ourselves. You know us better than anyone can know us. We pray this morning that your Holy Spirit would touch each and every one of us in a very powerful way. Reveal yourself to us, Lord, as your word penetrates our hearts. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus we give you honor, we give you glory, we give you thanks through him. Amen. Well, today we can conclude our study of the Beatitudes, and i just like to reflect back on those Beatitudes for a few moments here. You know, Jesus began by saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And he emphasized the fact that when we recognize our spiritual poverty, our need for God, blessing comes into our lives. He goes on to say, Blessed are those who mourn. Not mourning in general, but rather blessed are those who mourn over the reality of our sin and, and turn to the Lord for cleansing and forgiveness and new life. When we turn to him, we also find that even in the midst of mourning over great loss, there is hope and there is assurance because he's risen from the grave. He's coming back and he will raise us all on that last great day. Blessed are the meek, Jesus says, because they will inherit the land. Blessed are those who are humble before God and humble before others. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, who yearn, who yearn to know God better and to serve him more faithfully faithfully. Blessed are those who are merciful and show the very mercy we have received from God to others in our daily behavior and actions. Blessed are the pure in heart, Jesus says, for they will see God. Blessed are those who've been purified by the blood of Christ and who trust in him and find in him great peace and great strength. And blessed are the peacemakers, those who realize that it takes work to bring peace, who understand the price Jesus paid to give us peace with the Father, and who then respond to his great love by seeking to build peace with others in our relationship with others, in our relationship with God, recognizing that there is peace through Christ our Savior. Those are the first of the seven Beatitudes. And now we come to the one that seems, at least initially, rather strange. Matthew 5, verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All through the Beatitudes, we have seen Jesus taking the world's values and turning them completely upside down. And this one is perhaps the greatest example of that. Let's be honest. Persecution is not fun. We do not enjoy being made fun of. We do not enjoy being ridiculed. We do not enjoy being attacked. We do not enjoy being beaten. We do not enjoy being imprisoned. We do not enjoy living under the very threat of our lives. But Jesus says, for those who know him, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so the Beatitudes end in the same way they began. Jesus begins in the Beatitudes by saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And now he ends by saying, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What he's saying is, there is a cost to following him. And he does not say that to frighten us, but rather to remind and warn us. He does not say that to terrorize us, but rather to give us comfort when persecution comes. He does not speak those words to uh, force us away from him. He speaks those words so that when we go through the tough days, we turn to him. These are powerful words, 
and they are words that need to be taken to heart. We especially need to note what Jesus says. I've highlighted these words. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Now, please note, he did not say blessed are those who are persecuted. You can be persecuted for a lot of reasons. You can be persecuted because, well, you're no fun to be with. <laughs> but those are blessed who are persecuted because of righteousness because they are living for the Lord Jesus Christ, because they have yielded their lives to him, because he is seen in them, because his mercy, his love, his forgiveness, his values, his strength is being reflected in our lives. When that happens and we are persecuted because of it, we are truly blessed. Now, it should not surprise us that persecution comes for a number of reasons. One of them is the Bible tells us and tells us very directly. In fact, Jesus spoke to his disciples on the last night before his arrest, his trial and his crucifixion and death. He said, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. John 15 verse 20. Jesus made it clear to his followers that persecution will come to those who truly do follow him. And the Apostle Paul confirms that in a very powerful letter to his dear friend and colleague, Timothy, a, a young man who was uh, Paul's spiritual son. Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, he says, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, sometimes that persecution is very dramatic. In many parts of the world today, there are believers who are facing grievous persecution, imprisonment, attacks, some of them living in daily fear for their lives. Those things are happening and happening in greater number in our day. In the last 100 years, we have seen more persecution of Christians and more Christians killed for their faith than in the previous 1900 years of human history put together. We are living in a day when many are being persecuted. In the United States, that persecution often takes the form of ridicule, ridicule or, or personal attacks. But persecution is real. And unfortunately, it often comes from the people that you wouldn't at least at first glance expect to be the persecutors. Take a look at the Bible though. You know, when we look through the Bible, where does persecution often come? Well, sometimes it comes from people who are absolute pagans. But generally speaking in the scriptures, it comes from people who are religious. What's the first persecution mentioned in the Bible? Cain kills Abel, kills his own brother. Why? Because his worship wasn't acceptable before God like his brothers was. They have a worship war. Think of Joseph and his brothers. They not only hate his guts, but they sell him into slavery. And those who are closest to him are the ones who attack the most viciously. The list goes on. Moses, when he first stood up for the children of Israel, was forced to flee Egypt because he was ratted out by a fellow Hebrew. Even after God performed miraculous signs and wonders at the time of Moses in the Exodus, many of the children of Israel were ready to kill Moses and Joshua. Persecution often comes from those whom you would not expect it of. Persecution came that way to the prophets. I think of Jeremiah, who was cruelly treated and beaten and thrown into a cistern, not by unbelieving Babylonians, but by Israelite leaders, religious leaders, and kings. That, that happens all the time. The grievous and greatest example, Jesus himself. Our Savior was persecuted, and persecuted primarily by very religious people. There is, throughout the scripture, evidence of that type of opposition from those that you would not expect it from. 
And the reason appears to be that when people are truly living for the Lord, others who are just religious are offended by it, embarrassed by it, and angered by it. The enemy shows all of his teeth in those situations. And if you've ever gone through that in your life, you know how real and how painful that can be. The late D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of my favorite authors, a uh, medical doctor and a pastor of uh, Westminster Chapel in London for over 30 years. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote this a number of years ago. He said, formal Christianity is often the greatest enemy of the pure faith. He wrote those words back when I was a kid, but those words really are true. And Jesus is speaking in our day. He's reminding us that opposition comes when you're following him. When those things happen, don't be beaten down by them. Instead, remember, Jesus said this would take place. He said it would happen. And he also gave us a promise. And here's the promise. Matthew 5, verses 11 and 12. It's a follow-up on the eighth beatitude. Please note how things have changed. In the eight Beatitudes, they're all third person. Have you noticed that? Blessed are those who, are, who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Blessed are the peacemakers. All third person. But now we come to these words, and they are second person. Because this is really personal. Jesus is speaking to you and to me when we go through times of difficulty because of our faith in him. And this is what he says, blessed are you. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Do you realize how comforting those words are? When someone makes fun of you because of your commitment to the Lord Jesus, when someone speaks ill of you because your commitment to his values, when someone questions your goodness because you're a goody two-shoes, who makes you so special? When you are attacked, when you are betrayed by others because of your faith in the Lord Jesus, he's saying you are blessed. And more than that, there's a reward. Great is your reward in heaven. Do you realize what a comfort that is? At those times when we are going through the attacks of the enemy, to hear Jesus' words, great is your reward in heaven, gives new strength, deep peace, new power, and above all else, the reserve necessary to carry on, to trust in him, and to realize those words were spoken for your benefit and for mine. He spoke them so that when the difficult day comes, we would know that he is by our side. He will see us through. Over the years, I've heard the testimonies of many who have been persecuted for their faith. I have read accounts of believers who have gone through grievous personal attacks I've experienced some myself, and I know how they and I have found great comfort in these words. Great is your reward in heaven, but there's more. He says, when these things happen, rejoice, rejoice and be glad. Literally, this is talking about exuberant gladness. Rejoice and be overwhelmingly glad because great is your reward in heaven. Even in the midst of suffering, you and I, because of the Lord Jesus, we can rejoice. Now, as I was preparing this message this week, this past week, I should say, I was given some statistics that uh, really touched my heart and, and frankly changed my focus as to how to end this message. The statistics I was given have to do with uh, Awake Us Now's YouTube channel. 
And uh, now this is not our website. This is not Facebook. This is not our podcast. This is not live stream. Uh, this is the YouTube channel. What I was told this past week is that in the first nine months of 2019, we've had over 51,000 viewers on our YouTube channel. And what especially struck me is only about 40% of them come from the United States. They, they are people from 32 different nations, from every one of the continents except Antarctica. And as I looked at that, something else stood out for me. Many of these places are places where believers in Jesus are suffering incredibly because of persecution. In fact, as I read through that list, it caused me to uh, go to the uh, Open Doors site where they have the World Watch List. Open Doors is committed to exposing persecution of Christians around the world and identifying countries where opposition to Jesus and his followers is strongest. As I looked at the list, what I saw is that many of those who are on our YouTube watch list come from those countries where they are going through the greatest opposition, where many people actually live in fear of their lives because of their commitment to Jesus. And what it made me realize is that as I speak about persecution today, I need also to speak to them because the 60% of people who are watching that YouTube channel and coming from countries other than the country where I live, many of them are going through incredibly difficult times and know far more about persecution in a personal sense than I do. And I believe there is a word from God that will speak especially to them and to you and me as well. And the word comes from the first letter of the Apostle Peter. You know, of all the letters in the New Testament, this one seems to highlight persecution more than any other. First Peter is one of the most phenomenal, one of the most important, one of the most powerful books in all of the New Testament. It is one of those fundamental letters of the scriptures, but it is addressed to people who are suffering because of their faith. And the Apostle Peter gives a word from God that is very practical, very purposeful, and very powerful in the face of persecution. And so this morning, I speak to you, dear friends and uh, fellow believers here in my own country, but I also speak to our brothers and sisters around the world. I, I speak to those who are coming from countries where it is dangerous to be a follower of Jesus. Listen to what the Lord says to his children through Peter's words. First Peter, beginning at chapter one. If you take out your Bibles and turn to first Peter, you need to move toward the back of the New Testament. And uh, after you've found Hebrews and James, first Peter comes up and this is what Peter writes. Verses six and seven, after talking about the, the fact that we have been given a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, Peter says the following, in all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Now, please note that Peter is writing to these believers who are suffering greatly because of their faithfulness to the Lord Jesus and their confidence in him. And he says to them in that knowledge that Jesus is risen from the grave, that he has ascended to the Father's side, that he is returning at the end of time. In this, you greatly rejoice. We have a reason to give praise to God because we know what our destiny is and our destiny is to be with him, to live forever, to be in his very presence, to experience his goodness in all of its fullness. Peter says, in this you rejoice. Although right now, 
you may have had to go through quite a few trials in your life, he says. But more than that, he says, these trials have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith. You see, when you and I are persecuted because of our witness to Jesus, it demonstrates to others and us that that faith is genuine. If this were just a, um, if this were just a casual sort of thing, you know, let's not make any waves. Uh, I'll get to God every weekend, but I, I live the rest of my life on my own. People wouldn't be upset. But when the faith is genuine, it is often demonstrated by opposition. And Peter says that opposition is like testing of metal. Gold which perishes goes through the fire. When you and I go through the fire, we have the assurance that God is going to refine us even through that opposition. He is going to take what the enemy intended for evil and turn it around ultimately for good. And the genuineness of our faith will come to the fore. But there is more. Peter says that this may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Now, the grammar here is somewhat ambiguous. This can mean praise, glory, and honor to the Lord Jesus, or it can also mean praise, glory, and honor to you and me who go through the persecution. Now, I ask you the question, which of the two do you think it is? And my answer, yes. When we go through opposition, because of our faith in the Lord Jesus. And if you're going through great opposition today, you need to know this is bringing glory and honor and praise to God in the end. But it will also bring glory, honor, and praise to you from God when Jesus returns. There is great promise here. And it is just as Jesus had said in his Sermon on the Mount, blessed are you when people insult you and falsely say all kinds of evil things against you because of me. Rejoice and be exceptionally glad, because great is your reward in heaven. And remember that in the very same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That's not all Peter has to tell us, however. Let's turn 1 Peter chapter 20, or chapter 2 rather, middle of verse 20. Here is what he says. Peter writes and says, but if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. I love those words, that you should follow in his steps. I want to follow the Lord Jesus, don't you? And when you're going through suffering because of your faith in him, understand you're walking in his steps. And what happens is you can better appreciate all he has done for you and me. When we go through those times of trial and persecution, we understand more and more what the Lord Jesus went through. They accused him of being demon possessed. And if they persecuted him, it should not surprise us when they persecute us. Peter says, you're walking in his steps, but he says this as well. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And there again, when we go through times of great opposition, we are to follow in Jesus' steps not retaliating, not being as mean as our enemies are, not returning evil for evil, but rather overcoming evil with good, as the Apostle Paul told us. Peter gives this other counsel and guidance. 1 Peter 3, verses 14 to 16. He says, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. In other words, God is with us. Who can be against us? If the Lord is on our side, then we need not fear the attacks of the enemy. But Peter says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. 
Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. What he's saying is, let others know what you believe. When opposition comes, don't hide. Instead, rely upon the Lord. And as the opportunities present themselves, always be prepared to give an account of the hope that you have in you. By the way, that applies whether you're being persecuted or not. You and I are to always be prepared, ready, willing, and able to share our faith with others, looking for those opportunities, seeking the guidance of the Holy Spirit as he brings people across our path with whom we can share the love of Christ Jesus and the goodness of the living God. Peter says, that way, even when they attack you, they'll end up being ashamed when they see the outcome of your life. Well, let's move on. First Peter chapter four. Like I said, Peter has a lot to say about persecution and suffering here. First Peter four, verses 12 to 16. Peter writes this, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. In other words, when the opposition comes, don't say, well, has God forgotten me? When the opposition comes, don't allow the enemy to set the agenda by saying, well, obviously you must be in the wrong. Instead, when the opposition comes, Peter says, if you are walking faithfully with the Lord, don't be surprised. Don't be taken aback as though something strange were happening. He says, verse 13, but rejoice. Isn't that what Jesus said to rejoice and be extremely glad? But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal, even as a meddler. Well, there's a warning. <laughs> Don't suffer as a meddler. You and I are called to be gracious in our dealings with others, not to meddle in their business as self-righteous finger waggers. Instead, we are called to speak the truth in love and to demonstrate in humble lives of service and obedience to God and to others, the goodness of Christ. And so Peter, continues and says, however, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. I still remember the account from the book of Acts when the apostles were first beaten because of their testimony to Jesus. And what did they do? They went home rejoicing that they had been counted worthy to suffer for the name. When you and I face great opposition, when we are persecuted for righteousness sake, Peter says, consider it an honor. Finally, he ties it all together at the end of his letter. First Peter five verses 10 and 11. He says, and this especially goes to you who are going through very difficult and grievous trials today. He says, and the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. That is a promise, and it comes from God. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Our God is good. Our God is faithful. Our God is at work today to bring people on every, every continent and landmass, people of every tribe and tongue and nation to a knowledge of the Son of God. Opposition to that 
is stronger than it has been since Pentecost. But the reason is because the Holy Spirit is moving as never before. And you and I in these last days are seeing God move around the world in places where no one expected him to move and doing remarkable and amazing things. And the enemy is pushing back. But the Lord Jesus is speaking to you and me. And he says, blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness sake, because the kingdom of heaven is yours. He's saying rejoice and be extremely glad because great is your reward in heaven. He's saying, this is what the prophets who came before you went through. And you, and you are honored by God in this time of great testing to go through the fire and to know that the Lord is there. Even as he was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he is there to see you through the flame and bring you into the very light of his presence and glory. To him be praise. Today, tomorrow, in the midst of struggles, and forever. Amen. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we simply love you. We love you because you loved us first. We loved you because you, Lord Jesus, went through the fire for us. We love you because you endured such opposition from sinful people. And in doing so, you showed us that we too, by faith in you, can go forward without growing weary or losing heart. We pray your Holy Spirit's powerful presence on all who call on the name of the Son of God. We pray for our brothers and sisters around the world who are going through very difficult persecution today. We pray for believers who are living in fear of their lives because of their bold faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, Father, that you would comfort them with your Holy Spirit, uphold them by your word of truth, encourage them by your divine presence, and remind them that their brothers and sisters around the world are holding them up in prayer as well. Lord, may all of us be faithful. May we not hesitate to speak your name. May we boldly go wherever you lead. And may we, even in the face of opposition, rejoice and be extremely glad, knowing full well, great is our reward in heaven. Amen. A few items for discussion, okay? Uh, first of all, how have you experienced pushback because of your faith in the Lord Jesus? Uh, have you experienced that kind of pushback that comes from others who uh, are maybe just a little, little ticked off because of your faith and what you believe? What do you think Jesus, why do you think Jesus placed this beatitude last? Why did he end with this instead of start with it or put it in the middle? And, and finally, what encouragement have you found through Jesus' words in the face of persecution? They're great words, and boy, they do provide encouragement. God bless you, my dear friends, and God keep you in his watchful care.